Hello, welcome to episode two of The Ox Files. We look back at a season in Oxford United's history. Joining me, uh, two super fans, Dan Curtis and Martin Brunetsky, and our main guest, special guest today, Brian Horton. Brian, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Obviously watching lots and lots of football, which is keeping me going, so yeah, I'm okay. So we're going to look back at um, a season that ends with one of the most memorable games I've ever been at. Uh, I'll start off with Martin as the club historian. Just set the scene for us, Martin. What was going on 1991-ish? Okay. Um, in football terms, Oxford United had finished the previous season in a nice, comfortable 10th position in the second division. Um, we kind of had our ups and downs throughout the season, but uh, um, we ended up uh, finishing all right. Um, Brian obviously was the manager at the time. He uh, took us through and it, during the summer he uh, lost a few players during the summer, didn't we, Brian? We lost um, Richard Hill. Uh, we lost uh, two or three players that summer. Um, brought in a lot. Who, who else did we bring in that season, Brian? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing questions at me. Lots of, lots of changes, obviously, because of the financial situation. And um, the biggest uh, thing was having to sell players, like having to sell Paul Simpson, who I didn't want to sell. And, but we had to. Uh, the lucky one was not selling Jim Jilton in the end uh, when, when Derby had come on for him as well. So lots and lots of Andy Melville, uh, who was a great signing. Um, for tribunal that was, you know, where they were making fortunes for him. But that was, that was a good thing about Kevin Maxwell, that when I asked for, for uh, money, obviously before his, his father died, um, he was brilliant. He never interfered with uh, transfers, ins, outs, team selections. Um, he, he was fantastic to work for. Hold on, let me get my phone. Is that Mark Lawrence and Kevin Maxwell didn't interfere with transfers? <laughs> Brian, Brian, tell what happened. Dean Saunders, what do you remember of that one? Well, that 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 was uh, you, you're dead right there. That obviously they had the offer from uh, Derby County, and uh, it was a million pound, and um, they thought it was a good deal. Um, that's when. Ian Maxwell was in charge of Derby, and obviously his father owned both both clubs, so that was that was a tricky situation. And they stopped they stopped that happening just after that, didn't they? Where people couldn't own two clubs to stop that kind of thing, and that's why Mark wanted to resign because the fact was that we felt that if we'd have kept Dino, we'd have we'd have we'd have got promotion easily. I thought we'd have been the best team. Uh, team in the in division by a mile, so uh, you, you, you're right there that when you when you say that no interference, but sometimes that happens. And it it happened, it happened uh, with me at all City, where you have to sometimes sell your best players because of the financial implications. But when when that that offer came in for Dino, personally, I would have said no. Uh, I wouldn't have wanted to sell him, but obviously we had to. Another departure during the 1991 summer, of course, was Martin Foyle. And that came back to bite us big time in the first game of the season. But here we go. I mean, this, uh, I remember, like, I, I didn't go to this game, but uh, I remember following it on the radio and everything seemed to be going absolutely fine. Uh, and then this happened. We were winning 1 0 at the time. Uh, Melville, who was obviously such a key player to us, got a, a straight red for that. Um, and then Martin Bloody Foyle, who I absolutely loved as a player, uh, he he got two goals and won the game for, for Port Vale. I remember when we sold Foyle in the summer, I was really, really gutted because even though we had lots and lots of really talented forward players at the time, uh, he was such a good player. He kind of pulled everything together. What was he like to work for, Brian? Well, uh, that's that's correct. And that's what, what I'm saying about with Dino and, and, and him up top. Um, Mark had asked me to go and watch them play. They were already relegated out of Division One, and I went to North Forest to watch them play. Mark said, "Would well, you run the rule over us?" And I went and I said, "Well, if you keep that team, you know, you, you'll cruise up." So Foley was part of that, but his contract was up, and uh, he wanted to go. I thought he made the wrong decision, although it being my old club. But you know, I'm saying that because what happened was that Arthur Cox came on to us just after Dino had gone to say about. Um, uh, Marty Foyle and I said he, he, he's gone there and not, not that I've gone great with Ryder Cox because I didn't so when he went to tribunal we asked for a, a lot of money they offered a, list, a, a ridiculous price and uh, you know low and and we won the, we we came out well with the money 
but we wanted to keep Foyle. And I, I said to him, Derby can't have just been in for you. And he, did, he again, didn't believe, off, believe me, to be fair. And uh, so he chose to go to Port Vale, one of my old clubs. So I can't say, you know, it's a bad club because it's not. But I, I thought Foyle was a, an outstanding uh, striker. And obviously I in, inherited him again when I went to Port Vale later on in, in, later on in my managerial career. I think Port Vale got relegated this season in the end as well, actually. So it really was like a, a kind of strange decision for him. Um, right. But he was there for years and years, wasn't he? Um, I've seen him round about because he's been a scout for all, for all these years for various clubs. And uh, I got well with him, but I just thought he made the wrong move, to be perfectly true. Fully, as you're saying, he was a, a real good player for Oxford United. He loved living in Oxfordshire. I, I just didn't get what he did because he, if he had gone to Derby, he would have probably got more money than he got going to Port Vale. But we 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 had we couldn't do anything about it because it's freedom of contract. We couldn't stop him leaving, um, and that's what happens with the freedom of contract uh, situation. Well, we weren't in a great uh, financial position at the time. We weren't in like real disaster either because Maxwell's like empire hadn't started crumbling just yet. Is that is that right, Martin? Am I making that up? No, no, you're right. Um, we were still, obviously, Maxwell was still funding the club. Um, it was still uh, at the start of the season, a few months before he he died. Um, so, uh, but uh, I think, you know, obviously, we, we had a very poor start to that season. Didn't we? we lost the first four games, um, first five games, maybe. Uh, so it was, um, yeah, first five games. So it was like uh, the worst start we'd ever had to a season. It must, it must be very difficult to bounce back from that sort of start. When you, I mean, I know we weren't bottom. Bristol Rovers were bottom until they beat us uh, on the 21st of September. But uh, it, it must be very difficult to recover from that sort of start. Well, it is. I mean, yeah, it, it is. Absolutely. Um, just losing your best players doesn't help, does it? You know, and as I've said that just just previously, that he, he was... He was Fantastic, Kevin Maxwell. When I when I wanted wanted players in, the likes of Paul Simpson was quarter of a million from from uh, Man City, you know. And obviously we sold him for what was it six fifty, so big profit on it. And he was trusting me in the transfer market and the deals I was doing. So now you don't want to lose the first four games because it's uh, you know to get a start it takes some recovering. We were losing the Millwall game as well, two nil. Um... I think that was Trevor Aylott's debut. I think we were losing 2-0 and Aylott and Melville scored. Um, so, yeah, it could have been an even worse start than that. It could have been the first six games without a win. If you're going to do it, Dan, if you're going to do it right, you've got to do that when you say Trevor Aylott. My abiding memory is him on the halfway line doing that. Kick the goal, kick at my head. Um, not as skillful, should we say, as Martin Foyle, but he did a job for us, Brian, didn't he, Trevor Aylott? Yeah, that's what I was having to, to to do to to get players in to do to do jobs. I'd played with Trevor at uh, at Luton, so I knew what he was about. Um, he he was good in the air. He he kept the ball well. Lacked a bit of pace. Uh, great lad to have around in the dressing room with his experience. Um, as Steve Foster when I bought Fozzie in and made him captain, and uh, some of the sometimes when you know you can't afford top players and you're never going to get them to come to, you know, which Oxford was probably in, in Division One, one of the smaller clubs with, with, in terms of the attendances. So but I thought Trevor did a good job for us. The, the other end of the scale, Lee Nogan's got a couple of goals at the top of this graphic. Joey comes in later in the season, Chrissy Allen comes in. A little bit of pressure to develop those younger players as well, isn't there? Well, they were good players. We had a good youth policy. Uh, Malcolm Elias, uh, who works for Fulham, been at Fulham for a long time, uh, brought some good kids through, and those two, uh, those two were really, really good, exciting players. Uh, Joey, I could have sold to the Wolves for for a lot of money, which I turned down, or, or Kevin let me turn it down. Chris Allen went on to uh, have good moves. He joined me later on again in my in my uh, time at Port Vale. Great kid. I spoke to him not long ago. Um, saw him about whenever I've been to to Oxford United. I know he's he's left there now as a coach. Uh, but they were they were two great kids as well. Not just just good players. They were they were good kids. Did you know what a great player Joey Beecham was going to be in the Embryon? Was was it clear when he was 17, 18 that this kid was like you say destined for stardom? Obviously, he didn't in the end. But uh, did you know what a, what a great player he would turn out to be? He was he was so skillful 
mainly left footed and he, he, it's, it, he wanted to play on the right hand side a lot, Joe, which a lot of players do now. So they could come in on the, from the right, come inside and, and score goals, used to bend balls in, set pieces. He was, he was terrific at. Chris, he was a slightly different player because he just had uh, unbelievable pace. Uh, where Joey was probably a little bit more skillful, you know, in terms of his of his ball control and stuff like that. But th- they were two dynamic players, you know, for 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 a, a club like ours to have two young kids that have come through that both went for a lot of money in the end was was testimony to our youth policy. Sure, he was on loan to Swansea, wasn't he, at the start of this season? So uh, he didn't feature in the first few games. What was Paul Simpson like? I mean, he was my absolute hero at the time, Brian. Um, you know, everyone's got their favourite player. He is by far and away my favourite. What, what was he like as a character? Well, I tried to get him before and uh, when he was a bit younger and I, I could have nearly got him and then they changed managers, uh, Man City. I can't quite remember who they were, um, but I'd offered a lot less than they were thinking about all of a sudden. Man City was struggling and they threw him in, as I threw Chrissy and Joey in, Man City threw him in. And, and he was uh, he was absolutely different class. Hence, the fee went up to a quarter of a million. So a quarter of a million was quite a lot of money then. And obviously, Kevin trusted me in the transfer market. He was a player that set pieces. He was fantastic on his free kicks, his corners, uh, his goals that he, that he scored for a winger was, was terrific. And again, another good lad. We had a good team spirit within, within that group. And um, it, it, he was a joy to work with him. I've kept in touch with him. Obviously, he's gone on to, to manage England and the 21s and, and, and stuff and, and, and also be a manager at, at, in the Football League. Uh, just again, another good, an, another good player and a good person. Uh, good in the dressing room. Uh, very professional. Looked after himself. And um, yeah, joy to work with. Dan, what have you got on the videos? We're meant to be rattling through the games and we've talked about the players so far. Oh, so here, here is that Derby game. This is what this was our first win of the season, seven games in, and a big impact by Big Trev. Right off the training ground, this, by the looks of it. <laughs> oh, I'll take that. <laughs> Good finish there off Trevor. Has he got a headband on there as well? Yes. He has, yeah. <laughs> that must be yeah was Fossey in that game as well with two headbands. That's Simo with a free kick. Yeah, I think that's what we're talking about. <laughs> free kick in. That's what, seven games in. That, that's our first win. Was that a big relief at the time? As a manager, you must be panicking a little bit when you're like six, seven games without a win. Well, I think today, if you've gone seven games that win, your, your job's in jeopardy, isn't it? But, you know, Kevin, as I said before, was was uh, brilliant to work with. He he, he trusted me with, with, with doing transfer fees and just doing the deals. Um, so, and, and obviously... You know, when, when they were eventually sold, when we did have to sell them, Melville made money, Simo made money, Jim and Jilton made money. Um, it was deals that, that, that I'd done that, that um, kept the club going in the end because it was almost like a fire sale when, when things happened and developed. Um, it, was, it was just a crazy time, probably one of the hardest times in management that I've ever had. We also had this game. Um, oh. Any memories of this one? The uh, <laughs> I know, sorry, sorry. I remember that we had such a bad record against Swindon at the time. I remember taking this as a, even though we lost on penalties, I remember taking the three or draw as almost a victory. Huh? Yeah, I'll take that as well. Then. <laughs> <laughs> what I remember about that is the announcer saying, you're going to miss your train. The last train to Oxford is going soon. The last train's going. Well, the last train's gone. We all stayed because we could see it was coming to penalties. And then I blame you, Brian. You sent Trevor A. Lot to take the decisive one and they sent Glenn Hoddle. <laughs> I, I, I wish I'd have got on that train and missed all this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, Swindon obviously being one of the local teams is always a, a, a derby game. And, and funny enough, it was my first game for Man City when I went to Man City. It was back at Swindon and uh, we beat them in my first game. So a little bit of revenge. And obviously I went there with Phil Brown in my last job. Um, 
as his number two a couple of seasons ago. I enjoyed it, to be fair, and, and a lot of people, obviously, with the Swindon and Oxford connection, um, it can, can be difficult, but they, they were they were great. It was uh, we, we just missed out on the playoffs, and, and that's when we, we both were like, I left before before Phil Phil stayed for the next season and, and eventually uh, left there. But um, good football club. I mean Oxford. I I love the place. I, I lived in Woodstock and uh, I, I just love the place. And um, obviously when Man City call, come calling, you, you you can't turn that down. But you know I look back on tremendous fondness with the people. Uh, Jim Hunt, for exa example, the the secretary Mick Brown, and. Um, you know, they were good people, good people to work with. Who was your backroom team? Was it David Moss? Yeah, I bought, I bought Mossy in. We, do, we just <laughs> bought Mossy in before that because we needed somebody on the youth side, just part-time. And uh, Mossy was living in Swindon. And as I said to Mark, I've got the perfect person, you know, to come in and do that, that role. And uh, he came in part-time. And then Mark left. Um, I then... I had David Fogg with me for a little while, but then we brought Mossy in to do the youth side, as I said. And then I brought him up as my number two and, uh, you know, he came with me to Man City and, and to Huddersfield. Still speak to him to this day. Um, he he played for Swindon when I played for Brighton and uh, <laughs> we, we, we had some battles. He, he, he became my best friend when I went to Luton and we used to share rooms when we went on, on, on away journeys. Uh, Brilliant coach for the two wingers, uh, for the young ones when they came in, because they learned such a lot off him. And he used to take them for crossing sessions. And he, he could teach the kid. He could teach those two probably better than me because he was, Mossy was a fantastic winger, a tremendous player. One of the best I ever played with. Luckily, Rose's knee had given out by then or he would have had his work cut out trying to teach Peter Rose Brown how to cross it, wouldn't he? Well, Rosie yeah, again. Rosie, uh, Rosie, Rosie had a bad injury when I was there, didn't he? Uh, yeah. I think it's Steve McLaren had a coaching staff as well last season. I brought Steve in as a player, and I paid yeah. about five, five grand for him, I think. But um, I just wanted somebody to come in and sit in there, pass the ball, uh, and I knew he was good on the ball because I'd played with him at Hull City, and. Uh, it, it, I can't remember the fee now, but it was about five grand, I think. And he came in and played a few games, not many. And then I'd, I'd push Mossy, as I say, up to me to to, co to coach with me with the first team and uh, wanted somebody to take over doing the uh, youth team. And so I offered the job to Steve part uh, to Steve part time as well as playing and doing whatever. Uh, he did a good job. Then I pushed him up to the reserves. Uh, Morris Evans was still around. God bless him. Morris was really good to work with, and it, and 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 Steve learnt, I think, a lot of Morris and, and hopefully myself. And he went on obviously to to manage top clubs in England, so uh, helped him on 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 his way to get into coaching. Going back to like uh, matters on the pitch, things weren't going brilliantly in the league. Uh, we then got knocked out of the cup by Portsmouth. What, what was the mood in the camp like at the time, Brian? What was what's the difference then between a, a a team that's doing really well and the team that's struggling? How does how does that affect things like in, in the training ground and so on? Well, it, it does. I mean, it's, it's it's down to confidence, isn't it? When you're losing, and I'm just watching this now, losing to Portsmouth, and um, it, it, it's hard because you need you need your experienced players to keep the spirits up. And that's that's what I wanted Fozzy to do. That's what I wanted Jim Mitchell to do when Jim was captain. There's Fozzy on the ball now. And, and sometimes you need your senior players to to help you through that. You're not always in the dressing room, you know, uh, through through the week. You only see them when you go to the training ground, and and it's difficult. Um, but that's when you need good players and those characters that come through that. It's easy. It can be easy when things are going well and you're playing well and you're top of the league and things. I mean, Jim Jim a jump again showing the photograph there. Jim was was a great captain, and and he would never let people people. You know, uh, be despondent if you like. Training was always good. We had trained at uh, Bray's Nose College uh, down by the river, which is a nice training ground. And um, you need you need your players to step up. It's not always the manager's fault. I'm saying that being a manager, I've done over a thousand games. That sometimes you need your senior players to help in that respect. You talk about managing a thousand games. 
when when you watch like highlights like this, do you remember these matches? Do you remember what you were feeling at the time in this one, or is it all a bit of a blur? Some of these are a blur. You know, when you when you manage that many games, you can't remember every one, can you? I mean, I can remember I can remember just before I left, we beat Portsmouth. I think it was four or five at, at home. Jim Smith was manager, God bless him, and and so you know we we we'd flipped it a little bit there. So um, no, it's it's not easy when you're losing games, but. You know, Kevin. Kevin never put pressure on me. He, you know, which is great for a manager that you haven't got a chairman that is putting pressure on week in, you know, every day and coming to the football club. And and I'm not saying that's always the right way, but Ke Kevin never, never sort of got on my back, if you like. Never put pressure on me in that respect. And, and you know, you know, as a person, I, I'm a person that hated losing five or sizing training, whatever. And I, and I don't like losing games like that. And and I would probably be naughty with the players after the game because we just lost at home. And that's the way I was. I couldn't, I couldn't hide my feelings in that respect. So some players could take that, some couldn't. And and um, when you're in that, when you're in that kind of form, you can't be too critical because some of the players just shrink. And and that, that's that's no use to anyone. So you have to try and keep the spirits up and keep it going. And uh, you know, hopefully, we did. I'm going to ask a slightly slightly political question here. So the Maxwell family are right on your side. Uh, now I'm going, be, I'm going to trust this carefully. Not all the fans always were, because they're used to the 1986 team. They're used to the success. A lot of the more knowledgeable fans know that you're working under restraint from probably from this game onwards. Because, Martin, is this the one where Robert Maxwell is no longer on the scene after this game? Oh, that was the away game at Portsmouth. Uh, but yeah. Once Robert's not on the scene, you're working with your hands tied. And the knowledgeable fans appreciate that. But others think Oxford United have a divine right to be in the top division at that point. So, were you aware of kind of the feelings of the fans? Well, well yeah, no disrespect to Oxford at that time. I mean, you know, it, it, it was one of the smaller clubs in the division, and they'd done great to do what they'd done under Jim Smith. But, you know, sometimes you have to um, understand that you're never going to pay big, big money. Um, it's a smaller club. Do players always want to come to the smaller clubs? The answer is no. Um, it's just one of those things where you have to get on with it as a manager. You're looking for bargains all the time. That's why, you know, you're out as a manager. It's not quite like it is now with all the all the stuff that they can get on players, you know, on on on, uh, on a computer and see players uh, abroad. Uh, it's not quite like that. You, you're going scouting, you know, reserve sides. Obviously, I knew Jim Jutton say, for example, because I played against Jim uh, for Liverpool. He played for Liverpool reserves, and John Dernan played in the same game. And um, I played against him. I was player manager at Old City, and I played against Liverpool, and and two. Two of that, two of those two players stuck in my mind. So when I went to watch Jim play again, uh, when I, when obviously now I'm manager of Oxford, I went to watch him play. They beat Sunderland six, and and he was absolutely outstanding. And I I, I ran Kenny Del Glucio, I knew, and I, I just asked about Jim, and he said, yeah, he said his contract's up in the summer. Um, I want a hundred grand, and uh, which I thought was was a decent fee to, to be perfectly honest. I was quite happy with that. And he said if you try and you know, go cheaper or get to the football club over my head. I'll pull the deal and 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 that's it. So it's hundred grand. So I spoke to Kevin and he said, I, I, "I'd like Jim or Jolton. What's the fee? Hundred grand." And he said, "Okay, you carry on doing it. You know the wage scale. You know what we do, what we pay. Uh, go ahead and do it." And um, because sometimes, like now, you you, you have a director of football that does all that all of the, the finance he put in, in that time the managers did a lot of it so Jim came for 100 grand different class on the ball uh, again penalties free kicks uh, corners when it was his turn and he was just a, 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 a again a, just a, one of the leaders in the dressing room always full of fun Jim was very very rarely down didn't like losing obviously and he was a bad loser which which I liked um, there's no, you know, there's no room for good, for good losers, is there? So um, for hundred grand, it was a good signing. He did have a habit of getting run over by taxis, didn't he? But hey, everyone does that every now and again. Um, <laughs> how on earth, fine, how on earth did you manage a dressing room with my good friend Mickey Lewis, Jim Magilton, John Dernan? These are, should we say, strong characters. How on earth do you keep them all in check? Well, you you want the players to do that. Yeah, they were. I mean. Mickey Lewis came because 
Trevor Ebbard wanted to leave to go to Derby uh, the season I came in to help Mark. Um, and I said, well, I, I don't know what the fee was, what, what he, we, he was offering, I can't remember because I wasn't the manager. And I said, well, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't just take a fee. There's a lad there, Mickey Lewis, that will, you know, run through a brick wall for you. Not the most skillful, but absolutely 100%. You know who you're getting out of Mickey Lewis. So Mickey became part of that. And obviously, how long was he there? Mickey Lewis, you know, years and years. So again, another good signing for, for, for not a lot of money. Uh, yeah, character. Little Les Phillips, character. Well, Les, Les was quiet at the time, but a good player. And unfortunately, he got a bad injury when I was there. When we played a, a game at Newcastle, um, which should never have been played because the, it was it was waterlogged, and the referee should have never played the game. I'd told him that before the game, and then we were, we lost Les after after I don't know five ten minutes, and then he called the game off for the referee. And I, I went in the I went in the, in in the dressing room after in the referee's dressing room and said, you you've just cost me a player, Jim McChilton. I told you I didn't. Uh, Les Phillips, sorry, I, I didn't want a game started. Now we got a bad injury, and now we call the game off. So little Les was out for for a long time, and he he was a big miss to us because he was a good footballer. Funny enough, on the way to this game, I was I was going up to watch this game. I lived in London, and I was sitting on the coach, and the coach stopped at Shepherd's Bush roundabout, and who should get on? And sit next to me, but little Les Phillips. And I'm looking at him, going, "That's that's Les Phillips." And I, I was too shy to say anything to him until we got to the outskirts of Oxford. And then I leant over to him and said, "Are you playing today?" Like stupid question. He said, "No, no, I'm out injured at the moment." We got chatting and uh, walked up to the manor together. And he said, "Wait here." And he went inside and brought me out a ticket. So that, that's my Les Phillips story from a uh, from this match. And I think I used the money. In fact, I did use the money uh, that I saved on the ticket to buy this very shirt that I'm wearing today. So. I'm impressed it still fits, Dan. That's, that's, it it's, still a good shirt. it's a good shirt. I like it. <laughs> it's from that season, right? So uh, it's a horrible bit of nylon and really, really baggy. And I've put on about two stones since then as well. So, um, so moving on, uh, this is the next stage of the season. Uh, kind of slight upturn in form I think it's fair to say we're we're kind of we've got we haven't quite recovered from that really bad start to the season but form's improving a bit we're climbing a bit up the table and then uh, the Robert Maxwell situation evolves I don't know what Chris is going to let us say about the Robert Maxwell situation well no I, I, I don't think he's around to sue us now there was there were years and years when you couldn't say anything about Robert Maxwell could you but I don't think he's going to come back and, and haunt us with a with a suing now but let's just say that from where is that the 9th of November he's not around anymore and I think that one incident probably changed the fortunes of the history of, of Oxford United really I think so we, yeah. the creditors were trying to bring the money in from the club at the time so we'd obviously we owed the Maxwell family a lot of money is that right yeah well the club was losing about um 12,000 pounds a week that Maxwell was obviously uh funding the club for those losses. Uh, but like all these uh, rich people, they don't make money by giving it away. So there was all in forms of loans. And uh, so when, when he died, the creditors, uh, the people doing his estate, obviously uh, wanted to get their, um, get their money back. And uh, obviously the club couldn't afford that. So it was at this stage, I think, yeah, like Chris says, it, the fortunes of the club changed for the worse uh, forever, really. I mean, we had the occasional blippy season, 1905, 96, but, uh, Generally speaking, it was a downward trend for quite a few years, which has only been reversed uh, relatively recently. It's also noticeable, I mean, round about that time, you look at the top of this um, graphic here, and Lee Nogan scored a couple of goals, and then was he the first that you had to sell, Brian? A actually had to sell to keep us going? Look, it was, it was a case of um, first come, first go, yeah. basically. I, I, it, it wasn't choice of Lee to be the first one out. It was whoever... Who was, uh, who was ever offering money or big enough money for the club to take? Um, you know, it, obviously Simo went, and then, and I think I put this in my book uh, that Arthur Cox, then, who, as I said before, is not one of my favourite people, came back on for for Jim Jilton, and only a phone call from from um, from Kevin because I, I I said to him, Pat McGill, who, who was like, you know. Uh, Probably like a director of football type type thing. He was an accountant who'd worked for for Robert, and and I, I didn't tell him when I first got the offer about 
about um, Simo to start with. Uh, why, why haven't you told us this? Because I don't want to sell him. Uh, basically, you've got to sell him. So off he went in, and then a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call from Jim McJilton offering uh, equivalent to probably Simo's wages. I, I told him where to go. Didn't tell anybody again. And uh, he found out Pat McGill and, and said he's got to go. So I said to Pat, can you get Kevin Maxwell on the phone for me then, please? And uh, Which he did. And uh, he said, yeah, he's got to go. Brian said, well, will you do, a favor? Will you do me a favour? I said, would you pay me up? I said, because I can't do any more. If I lose Jim and Jilton, um, we, we, we're relegated. We, we, we will go down. And uh, he said, give me five minutes. And he came back and he said, uh, how he did it, I do not know. Um, and he came back and said, no, you don't have to sell him, keep him. And uh, and that's, that helped us tremendously. Because I think if I'd have lost Jim, I would, have, I would have lost the dressing room because he was the leader in the dressing room. He was not the best player as well, but he was the leader in the dressing room. If I'd have lost him, we, we would have, we'd, I don't know where we'd have gone. So uh, thanks to Kevin. Um, Kevin, Kevin, another little story with Kevin. I thought, again, uh, he, 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 we had a situation where we had a, a meeting with it, with little shareholders and, and the f- supporters in the in the in the clubhouse at the manor, and the question was fired at Kevin. You know, we're not doing very well. Uh, have you thought about the manager's b- position? And Kevin turned around and said, uh, "We're not here to discuss the manager's t- uh, uh, situation. I'm quite happy with what Brian's doing, and so so uh, 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 the board and whatever. No no questions." So that was it. And then about 20 minutes later, another one came on and said the same thing. That, well, we have a right to ask about the manager's um, position. And Kevin said, well, I'm not going to say this again, but if there's any more questions about the manager's uh, situation, I'll stop the meeting tonight. We could pull the money out of Oxford United and it'll go bankrupt. Uh, the, the, there's no further questions about the manager. Meeting finished and he said to me, Kevin, are you going to buy me a point for that? I've, I've stuck up for you. <laughs> I think I bought him a pint of bitter, and we and we got on with it. And he he, he was he was he, he never put put me under pressure. He probably realised what was happening in terms of the finances and whatever. And uh, you know when it when when Robert Maxwell did die, I I, I spoke to Kevin briefly. Uh, I knew what I had to do because the next morning. After we'd found out, me and Mossy were coming back from a game in the Midlands watching player, watching a player, and it came about 10 o'clock in, at night. And it came on the news that Robert Maxwell had, had gone overboard off Lady Ghislaine and, and um, the club the club will, will you know, no longer be funded by the Maxwells because basically there's no money. Either the bank have pulled all the, all the, all the plugs on the money. Um, you've got to go in tomorrow, take your club car back, take your club phone back. Uh, and then you've got to start selling players uh, to keep the club afloat. And luckily, you know, this is where I think I did a fair job, and a lot of people thought I didn't, but I thought I'd done a fair job by getting players in that actually were saleable players. I didn't want to sell them, obviously. You don't sell your best players ever. But but And and also keeping the club in in, in Division 2. You know, people don't, don't respect how, how hard it is to stay in that division, i.e. the championship now. It's a good, good and some Big clubs in there, good clubs, and uh, I thought I'd good, done a good job in, in managing the, the football club. Not in terms of maybe, which you want to do as a manager, be up there fighting for for a promotion uh, and having good cup runs. You don't, but sometimes you've done a good job by just keeping them in 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 that division, as I'd done with Hull for 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 four years, keeping them in the equivalent to the Championship Division One. And it, you know, it's not it's not always easy to do. People talk about a siege mentality. At this point, then, are you saying to the players, there's no one going to help us, it's us against everybody else? Is that part of the management technique at that point? Well, it, well, well, well not really, because I can't tell the players what I'm doing and what I'm fighting against, can I? I mean, I just so got to... You have to keep it away from them, right? Do you have to well, keep you, it away from you, them? Have, you have to. You have to keep it away from them, and, and I think it's the only way to be. You can't, you can't blame, you know, things that, that they're not really... Bothered about it, to be perfectly truthful. While well, they're footballers, all they they're, they're worried about is that they, they, they want to play, obviously, and that they want to they want to win games as much as anybody else. If you but when you're selling your best players, you are you are you know making it harder for them as well as for, for the fans and and for me. I guess we're lucky as well. We'd sold obviously Lee Nogan, which I remember being quite a big loss, but then suddenly in comes Joey Beecham, 
and everything starts to feel all right again. Well, Joey, I mean, eventually sold him for a million. I, I, I turned an offer um, with Kevin. Kevin didn't, didn't force me to, 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 to sell him at that time, uh, but I had an offer from, from Wolves. Um, so I think about a million pounds, what he went to West Ham for. And, and they said to me, what do you want to do? I said, no, I don't want to sell him. You know, for a million quid. And, and res with respect again to Kevin, he, he didn't say, no, we need it. You've got to, you've got to sell him. We kept him and uh, he, he helped us do what we did, you know. So, and then eventually Harry Redknapp came for him and he, he went to West Ham, but just, it just didn't happen for him, did it? Um, he was a homeboy. He was an Oxford boy through and through. His mum and dad and family were big Oxford fans, and he he he, he probably shouldn't have gone there. He, you know, if, if that's the way you're made and what you are, because Joey was a quiet boy, very very quiet in the dressing room and and around it. But but again, a good trainer, good person, but very quiet person. Were you confident putting him in the team in that difficult situation? Well, no, because we always fancied him. You know, to, when he came through the youth team and, and through the reserve team, we, we saw what he could do. And um, I, can, I can remember in a game we played pre-season and uh, Terry Feeling, who eventually, um, you know, I managed at Man City, he'd play for Wimbledon. Joe Kinnear was the manager. We beat him 1-0 in, in the competition. He was to play for a trophy uh, to start the season. We played Wimbledon. And, and he took he Terry Feeling to, to absolute bits. And then Terry got, after him, just a couple of games later, he was sold to to uh, to Man City, and he'd absolutely uh, tortured him playing, you know, on the right wing, as I said, coming in. But he, Joey could go inside, outside. He, he could cross it with his right. It wasn't as good as his left, but he, he was he was a good player. He'd be worth an awful lot of money today because of his talent, because of the, the what he what he produced. I think that was his first goal for the club that we just showed there. I think that's the case. Make it difficult for you, Dan. I'm actually, you've got to edit this carefully, but I'm actually probably in that picture in the Oslo Road there, which was <laughs> full of moaning old men and me trying to tell them all to be positive. It was a unique stadium, wasn't it? It was just, I remember standing there with my dad on this game or so many brilliant games. What a place to play your football. It, it was. It, uh, I enjoyed managing there, and uh, you know, it, obviously the slope and and what have you. But it was. Uh, it, it, it was a. It was a nice little ground, compact. The pitch was always good. I Mick mean, Moore, the 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 the, uh, the groundsman who I've just sent a book to, signed to him a couple of weeks back. Keep in touch loosely. It was a good groundsman. The pitch was always perfect. And it was it was when when it was full, it was it was a good atmosphere. Uh, the home fans were good, um, and I enjoyed I, I enjoyed every minute of my time at Oxford United. Although the, it was hard, as I've said before, but I, I did enjoy my period there. Remember this game, Brian? Five two. Ozzy Ardiles his last game in charge of Newcastle, I think. It, did he get the sack after that game? Yeah, it did. Yeah, um, it's quite funny, really. And I'm pro uh, I remember the fog at this game. It was so bad. You had literally no idea what was going on at the other end of the pitch. It's probably good for a manager not being able to see what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 it's funny because uh, Ozzy was manager of uh, Tottenham when, when I was manager of Man City and we beat them five again. And I think he got sacked just after that one as well. So again, probably not one of my favourite. He's I'm not one of his favourite people. But no, I mean, that's a great win against the... Uh, a big, big team in that division. I do remember that game, yeah. I remember that game well. I think this was a game before they appointed Keegan, where everything comes turned round for Newcastle. Um, we always beat um, Literally, you had no idea what was going on at the other end. So you'd hear a cheer, like when Newcastle scored. And you'd be like, oh, God, you couldn't see it. <laughs> we, would like, <laughs> we would cheer when we scored, and like the, the fans around the ground would kind of cheer when we cheered. Probably good for a manager that as well. He can't see everything, you know. <laughs> this one's really, really, really what, what, was, what was that form looking like? Though? We kind of turned the corner a little bit. There were certainly kind of glimmers of hope. You know, we weren't dead and buried. Whereas a bit earlier on in the season, I was starting to think, you know, we're in big, big trouble here. But I remember around now, you know, the introduction of Jerry Beecham, um, you know, there was that kind of that spirit. You know, you know the team had really pulled together. 
Um, Brian will be able to tell us more about what it was like then. Uh, I, I do remember that game. I didn't remember it, it was that frightening to be very truthful. And, and we had some good wins where, you know, we were attacking side. We never never set out to be a defensive side. Always played with two wingers, you know, when I could. Uh, um, obviously, Simo was the, probably the pick of them and made the club a lot of money. Um, and we always set out to, to play that way. So I think some people would appreciate the fact that it was attacking football and you're going to lose some of them. And um, you, I, wanted to, I wanted to play that way. Um, Can I ask you a question about recruitment, Brian? So yeah. somewhere in the middle of all these, he's not going to be on the score sheet, but I think Gary Smart's around, around about this time. Kerry Evans comes from the university. You're having to recruit from all over the place, aren't you? Well, take Kerry Evans then. Kerry, Kerry was at university in Oxford. Someone had asked, could he come up and train with us? What is he, 6'3"? Mm-hmm. Built like a... Steady. Like a rugby player. He was massive and strong. And what a, what a great lad. Very, very bright and intelligent player. And, and uh, he trained for a couple of, for a couple of weeks. And, and I, I said to Mossy, wow, can you put him, in, him, him and Fossey together? So, which, which I did, and of Foz, he learned so much of Fozzie in a very short space of time. And, uh, you know, he became a good, so he was for nothing. And that's what we, that's where we're working at a lot of the time. You know, we hadn't got much money and we're trying to do deals like that. And um, K- Kerry was, a, again, great lad, which I liked. You know, I looked at characters. Can they be, can they, can they step up to that dressing room? Can he play with Steve Foster? Fozzie was like me, he, he was the demanding player. That, you know, that he pulled people around him and he'd have a go at people if they gave the ball away or didn't win a tackle or didn't win a header. And, 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 and Kerry learned from that. Looking at the form here, so we've, we've obviously beaten uh, Newcastle. Uh, things are definitely picking up. And then we go to Brighton away. Again, another game I was at and a brilliant performance by uh, Paul Simpson. Go again. That's what the Oxford fans must have thought. Was this when Brighton were similar to us, they've been at the top level and were slightly on the decline at that point. They were well, a bit of an upset this game. I was quite surprised that we'd won this one. Well, for me, it was always a, a pleasure to go back to Brighton. Obviously, I had great years down there as a player and went back as a manager later on in my career. Um, so to go back with Oxford United and 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 and, and win at Brighton was always fantastic. And um, again, no, I, I don't remember that game to be perfect. Truth, I should do really, shouldn't I? With two sides uh, where I spent, you know, good spells. Um, you sold Paul Simpson the next day. Is that is that spurs your memory? Yeah. Well, as I said. I didn't want to sell him. Um, I tried, tried my best to keep him, but he, we had to sell him for that kind of money, which was a big profit. And um, you don't want to lose your best players. You don't want to lose your best people. And 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 and, and Simo was both of that. So yeah, these are players I, I I worked out. You sold that season. It's obviously Foyle at the start of the season. Steen went a few games in. He was a good player, Mark Steen, wasn't he? Yeah, well, he, he, I'd played with his brother. Mark was a young lad coming through when I was at Luton and I uh, didn't actually play with him, with him. I played with his brother, Brian, who was, again, an outstanding player. And and obviously, I've seen Mark come through the youth ranks at, uh, at Luton. So I, I knew what he was about, and he, he was. He went on a great career, didn't he? Uh, good little player. Uh, quiet. It, Mark was quiet. wasn't, you know, like a, a fuzzy or... Um, Les Phillips or whatever, and uh, you know, or a Jim Jordan, but a, a good, good, good player. And again, you know, ones you have to sell to to keep the club afloat. This is what some people, which which not annoys me, but people don't always respect what you've done in terms of buying and selling to make profit. I know some of them, you know, because you don't win on every trans- transfer as a manager, but some of the players that bought in that were making the club. St- still viable and keeping going. That was basically what it was, some of the sales. Here's the big game. This is one we're all looking forward to. <laughs> Tell me you remember this one, Brian. Tell me. I can remember this one, yeah, yeah. Obviously, against the local rivals. Yeah, I can't remember this one. I can't remember his scores of five. You can tell me who scored the five goals. We've not mentioned the goalkeeper yet. Whoever was in goals just chucked one in for you there. Vasey? Was it Kenny Vasey? 
Paul Reese? Yeah. No, Reese was later. I'm sure Midway Reese was later. Half, I think it was Ken Vasey. It was Ken Vasey. With the equaliser. Yeah, he's a good player. He's good goals. I've said I should play for the, the Liverpool reserves. He was lively. He was lively as a person. Lively in the dressing room. Uh, lively around it. To get a penalty. Surprise, Chris has gone to ground. Ninth of the season. Uh, Majorton on the penalty was a, yeah. And three minutes later, that became three-one. Not a good. Day. Trevor with his air of band again. Shot here was certainly moving, but the keeper. See, it could be people. I mean, it's all this today. Great well, goal, running at people and taking them on and shooting from back. what twenty-five yards. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. That is useful as a Welsh winger at Twickenham, but Dave Mitchell slid in, and that was three-two. No, I wouldn't have been happy with like goal with time break. Body and well, whoever uh, uh, you know, scoring from 11 years the head, happy with that one. And scored again. John Dernin, That's Christy again, beating people on the outside. Great crossing. System was struggling like an old Hoover by now, not picking up the bits that matter. This was the first time we'd beaten Swindon in years and years and years and years and years. And years, and years, and years. We probably shouldn't talk about that too much, but I mean, it was. We never beat them. And at this point, I knew we were staying up. I have to say, once we've beaten Swindon. Yeah, if you saw some of these goals now on Match of the Day or on Sky, or whatever, and you know people like that running at defenders with a pace and stuff that Chrissy and, and, and Joey have just done, you'd be selling them straight away because that that that's what's lacking, I think, big time in some of our games now that I watch, you know, with a pace and um, an ability that those two kids had, you know, to come through the rank, they come through the ranks and cost us nothing. That's what Malcolm was saying. Malcolm Elias was more uh, uh, bringing the kids in from from the from the schools into the into the football club, rather than being a, the chief scout. Uh, I had above watching senior players and watching games. Martin, how how long had it been since we'd beaten Swindon? Um, off the top of my head, I think the last time we beat them was that five 0 game at home in the eighty four was eighty three eighty four season. Well, no, eighty two eighty three rather when uh, George Lawrence saw them at home. But uh, it's been a while, certainly. Just for podcast listeners to this, Martin Brudetsky has been joined by one of his cats on the on the Zoom call. Well done, Martin. That's, that's yeah. really Velvet. Say hello, Velvet. <laughs> um, Remember this game? Because this was billed as Joey Beecham against Darren Anderton. Well, you are, what, what a career Darren Anderton had, and you're talking Joey and the same and I remember Joe Beach was just such a better player than Darren Anderson. So every time I saw Darren Anderson playing for England after this point, I kept thinking that should have been Joey. Yeah, it could have been. If he'd have probably been playing for a more a bigger club where Portsmouth were bigger than us at that time. And uh, Jim Smith would probably be manager of that team, wouldn't he? Yeah. Yes, he was. I think so, that time. Yeah. This season then boils down. We're getting towards the end of the season. Um, after this one, and then if you come down to put the graphic back up, down if you can. I don't know whether you go up or down on your screen. When we get to it, must be Easter uh, Bank Holiday weekend, where um, the Saturday and Monday down there, um, 18th and 20th of April, we do Bristol Rovers and draw at home, and then we lose to Portsmouth. And at that point, Dan, you just said you thought you knew we were safe. I definitely didn't. Right, at that point, the results are pretty good. We've only lost one in like six or seven towards the end. But it all boils down to Tranmere, and that's the reason that this season is so memorable. That Tranmere game, Brian. What, how many times have you been asked about the Tranmere game? Because if there's ever a game you're going to remember, it's that last game of the season, isn't it? Well, it, it, well if, I, if I remember the games, we played, we played uh, Plymouth away with three games to go, and we, got, we, we lost. And... Um, Peter yeah. Shilton was manager of Plymouth and they thought they were safe because I knew the chairman quite well because he was a Brighton fan that lived in Crawley Bruce, chairman of, of, of Plymouth they, and I was having a chat with him after the game and they'd beaten us uh, I think Jim and Jill got sent off in that game and um, they thought they were safe and it really bugged me that they thought they were safe with two games to go and I think then we drew with Ipswich at home and yeah. And Paul Key was absolutely unbelievable that day. And I mean, unbelievable. How we got a point that day, because I think Ipswich were, were, were right up there. Now, well, they did they get that was, that was the game that sealed Ipswich promotion to the 
to the top division. Yeah. yeah. So so how we got to point out that I, I do not know. And then obviously now you're looking at that and, and we've got to go to we've got to go to um Tramir and win. And and Plymouth have got a a home game against Blackburn. Kenny Dalglish has just taken over Blackburn and he's got them right up there firing and they they need to win um to to get to get to get promotion. Uh or in the play were the playoffs in then? Would have been playoffs. Yeah. 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 yeah they all get, yes, to get in the playoffs. So we've got to we've got to win at Tramia and we've got to hope that Blackburn beat Plymouth. And we 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 could talk about it a bit more if if you like after this story, but we have, we have to win at, at uh, Tramia. I asked, can we go and stay overnight? And we've got no money, obviously, and things were tight, and they, they allowed us to. Uh, we stayed at a village hotel, probably one of the cheapest we could we could get right around Tramia, around Birkenhead. And um, so we tried to do it properly. And then the, we won at Tramia, obviously. Now we come off the pitch and we want to know how Blackman and Plymouth have gone on and they're still playing because Blackburn had taken that many fans down there. The, 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 their kickoff was delayed. So now we're, we're still on the pitch waiting for the result to come through from, from, from Plymouth. And obviously Blackburn beat them and we stayed up, which was, which was a fantastic feat, the players. They, 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 over that little period, they'd done brilliant. You know, to be because everybody was... On the knees, basically, the fans probably were. We were. I was outwardly, but I couldn't. I couldn't show show that to to um, the players. And and it was fantastic that we stayed up. To be perfectly truthful, and and they, they as I say, they thought they were safe after they beat Plymouth, and that, that probably helped us in that in that scenario. In my so mind, the, the commentator here sets it all up first. You'd need a maths degree from Oxford University to work out United's chances of staying up. A win would give them a good chance. A draw would be tantamount to playing Russian roulette, and defeat would be good night. So loads and loads and loads of fans there that day. I wasn't there that day. I was working that day in the shop at the time. Um, um, the day uh, off. Masters. Um, I, I can tell you a story about that. Um, I'd had rather a lot to drink on the way up, and I walked in. There you are, Brian. Looking very down. Yeah, um, looking there. <laughs> walked in with my mate, and my mate, um, because he'd had too much to drink, was hastily pushed to a cell where there was another fan looking a bit forlorn. And he said, what's up with you? He said, I was doing the 92 club. This is my 92nd ground. But I've celebrated too early and got arrested. So he never saw the game and he got a two year ban from football. So <laughs> this would have been his 92nd. Oh, wow. Showing then, Mr. Hat for the chances, Brian. What yeah, were you thinking? very tense. Well, it, it, you know, it's a bit of a blur because you, you, as a manager now, you, you, you're just open and praying. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> There you go. I was saying a little prayer there. That 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 you 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 are going to win. We did. Through, was it was it two, two one? Yeah. Two one. And, yeah. And that that, that Kenny Snyder Blackburn are, are going to do us a favour. And luckily, they had they from our point of view, they had they had to win to get in the playoffs. So if they'd have gone down there and not having to win, he might have played some younger players. Uh, and what have you, but he, he, he obviously needed to win a game to get in the playoffs, and, and, and they did, and they went up. So, um, I mean, the, the crowd we took, I mean, fantastic uh, fans that day. Tremendous. Oh, that centre forward was a tram there. Looked like he could score a goal or two. Who was the striker? John Aldridge. Wasn't that was John it John Aldridge that day? Yeah, was it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He called the tram goal scoring record with that goal. Did he? And uh, I mean, obviously, he, 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 wouldn't, he wouldn't have. Wanted to score that goal to put Oxford down after being such a special player, Oxford yeah, would he? Yeah. You wouldn't want to do. Yeah. Uh, he, actually, he actually said before the game that his ideal result was for him to score and for Oxford to stay up. So you can't describe it, can it? I mean, it's like you've won the FA Cup. You know, you have your highs and lows. Um, this is as much of a, a high that you can have sometimes, and it's a relegation battle. It was the most important goal that I've scored. And obviously, it was a bit disappointed when they equalised, but then Joby went and scored the winner. Tremendous. I've missed uh, four in the first half, probably easier than that. And uh, Mickey Lewis gave me a great ball, and it was probably the hardest chance. I just got a foot to it, and I uh, went for the keeper's legs. Unbelievable. There's your champagne as well. Who paid for that then, Brian? <laughs> Probably me. Probably claim it on my expenses, maybe. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? The, the fact there's 
you know, you celebrate like this by staying up and it's one game that I look back on with, with tremendous pride, really, because we've done what we've done under unbelievable circumstances. And um, we we had a good drink on our coach going back. We went to a charity game the next day where I asked the players to go because it was for charity. They all turned up and we had more drinks on the Sunday. And that was just just for staying up. Um, which happens. So I had that in my career as a player when I, we had to win at Man City that day when I was playing for Luton. And you know, the game, days like that, you know, you never ever forget. You know, it was it was special. So a couple of times you've mentioned you've managed over a thousand games. You've been very good at not plugging the book, but there is a book out, isn't there, Brian? Yeah. What, what happened was I did. I did um, I did a chapter, uh, the writer called Tim Rich, who, who's a brilliant writer. He did a, he did a book on Man City managers and around me up said, what, what I do, my chapter, can he come and, you know, do an interview and do it? And so Alunga came, did my chapter and, and obviously talking about other things. And he went, wow, you got some good stories, haven't you? And I said, well, I should have, should know all the games I've had. And he looked it up and he went, wow, you've had over 2,000 games. It's only uh, Alex Ferguson and Graham Turner done that. Um, he said, uh, basically, have you ever thought about doing a book? And I said, well, I have, and, and, and I would like to. So he said, well, I, I'd love to do it for you. He'd done Ron Atkinson's before. He'd done uh, Bielsa's just before. These managed Kantielskis, and they'd all done well. And uh, we got the publishers, uh, Pitch Publishing, and, and off we went. And um, it was great to do. Just something, obviously, with this pandemic, and to, to do it all whilst that was on and... Start from my schoolboy days <clears throat> uh, with a school team at 11, and, and I still keep in touch with some of those, uh, my teammates from that era then. And it just went from, from being at my school days right through to to manage a 1,000 games, which is which gave me, it, that's, it probably gives me more pleasure than anything, the fact that I'd, I'd got a free transfer at 17 and then went back in the league to be a player and then go on to manage a, a, over a thousand games. There's only about 30 ever done it. And then to do 2000 games, there's only three of us done it. You know, it, it gives me a lot, a lot of pride. But people say, well, yeah, some of were smaller clubs. Well, yes, they were. And some were, were hard jobs because they're smaller clubs, like I've just said about keeping Oxford in, 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 in Division One and all in Division One, and, uh, and, you know, never got relegated. Um, in, in in that time, same as um, you know, I went to Port Vale and kept them another five years stint. I was very lucky in that respect that I had five years with Don Robertson at at, um, at Old City, five years with Kevin, and then five years at Port Vale. So all these stories and memories are in the book, and uh, apparently it's doing very well. It's a shame we can't come and do book signings, you know, at, at Oxford. I came recently to do them down from the Man City game, and I got invited down. Uh, by Rosie asked me to come down and Peter Rose Brown and do a, a Q and A, which I did, and um, I, I did great memories from my time at Oxford. Night, good people, always want them to do well. The new with the new ground, and obviously, and Carl Robinson is a good manager. I like him and get on well with him. And you know, it's a, it's a club that I, 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 you know, it's dear to my heart. Really, that the time and. The people I worked with, you know, I've named some of them, you know, that 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 um, were, were not foot, on the football side, if you like. Um, just just really enjoyable day. So all that's gone in my book, and uh, the pitch publishing are happy with it. Said it's going really well, but as I said, I can't go into book signings at Man City, at Hull, at Brighton, and uh, at Oxford, at Luton, and so hopefully one day I'll be able to do it. You know, when it's free, that that people. Uh, we'll still hopefully want to buy the book. And it's, as I say, it's, apparently it's gone down really well. It's been an absolute honour to have you on here. Thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you again. Dan and Martin, we'll see you in episode three. Let's sort that out next week. But for now, Brian Horton, thank you very much.